Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Nadia Ali. I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Studies at Brown University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's event entitled Creativity, Art and Culture in the Arab Countries of the Gulf. Uh, this uh, event today is part of a series that um, we are co-hosting and co-organizing with Columbia University, with the uh, Middle East Institute, um, with Professor Catherine Spalman Poots. Um, and the series looks more broadly at um, gender and body politics in terms of arts in the Middle East and the diaspora. And uh, so far, Catherine and myself have been in conversation with the Palestinian artists, Basil Abbas and Turan Abu Rahme, the Iranian artist Morishin Ali Yahri, and Lebanese artist Tanir Khouri. And you'll find the recordings of these conversations on our respective, respective websites. Now, today we will be in conversation with Dr. Alia Senussi. And um, before I'm going to introduce Catherine, who will be in turn introducing Alia. I just wanted to say a couple of things about the structure of the event. So Catherine and myself will be in conversation with Dr. Alia Sunusi. Um, we encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A. There will be time towards the end. We will be showing images as well. And I uh, also just wanted to say a word about the title because we've received some emails um, complaining about the use of the term golf. Um, so we just wanted to um, recognize uh, that the uh, labeling of the golf, whether it's called Persian golf or Arab golf, is contested. And um, so we chose to... Um, use the title Arab countries of the Gulf. Um, so because we are speaking specifically about um, Arab countries in the Gulf, but we um, you know, don't want to take position whether we call it Persian Gulf or Arab Gulf, this is contested. And we just wanted to say that to preempt um, you know, further conversation about that. But we welcome your comments. So now let me introduce um, Catherine. Catherine uh, Salman Putz is a sociologist on faculty at Columbia's Middle East Institute and the Aga Khan University in London. Her research focuses on women and gender dynamics in Muslim communities in the UK and the US. She has particular interest in rituals and cultural production within the context of diasporic spaces and their connections to wider social moments. Over to you, Catherine. Great, thank you so much, Nadia. Welcome everyone. I'm really delighted to introduce Dr. Alia al Sanusi today. Um, I'm going to go through her bio and, and kick off with the questions. Um, Dr. Alia al Sanusi is a cultural strategist. She's a patron, she is a writer, she is a public speaker, and she is an academic. Uh, she studied at University of London at SOAS, which is the School of Oriental and African Studies, where she did her, her PhD in politics. And I think we'll talk a bit more about that later, but she looked at the nexus of, of power and um, cultural patronage featuring Saudi Arabia as a case study. Uh, she also, before that, she graduated um, with great honors in international relations and Middle East studies from Brown University, where she also has an MA in political science from Brown. Additionally, um, she has an MSc in Law, Anthropology, and Society from the London School of Economics. Um, so she has poured all of that knowledge into the contemporary art world, where she's a, a very active member. Uh, she has been very, for many years been a conduit, a connect, like a connecting um, tissue for artists with institutions, with art professionals, with galleries. So she's really pulled a lot of different um, people and projects together with the aim of, of being of sort of creating a trans regional ecosystem for the arts. Um, this work has included creating and producing the celebrated contemporary arts Biennale, which launched in Saudi Arabia in 2021. And you can read um, more fully in her bio 
and she's an, a, a member of many important boards and councils, including being a founding member of the Tate's Acquisitions Committee for the Middle East and North Africa, which has been a really dynamic board, um, as well as the board of 154, the African Art Fair, the Middle East Circle of the Guggenheim, the Middle East Studies Advisory Committee, again at Brown University, as well as the Board of Patrons of Arts, um, Art Dubai, where she was a founding force in that initiative. Uh, so Alia, you have such, um, so please join us, Alia. You have such a rich biography. Those are really just, just bullet points. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, it does sound like I was in school forever, but actually <laughs> I graduated Brown really young. So that's why I, I, I kind of continued the, the master's course. I graduated Brown at 20, so, and I didn't want to leave. I love being in Providence so much. <laughs> that's wonderful. Yeah, well, I wanted you to talk a little bit more about your trajectory and, and talk about how it has sort of meshed with the arts world in the Middle East. And both um, Nadia and I were really interested in this, this concept of cultural strategist. So I'm wondering if you could also tell us what you mean by that and how it applies to your work. Well, I think, you know, I often get asked, what do you do? <laughs> I never really, you know, it took me a long time to kind of figure out how to, to define it. Um, and you know, my, my life and my work really, you know, kind of began at Brown and also began um, at school before. So my last two years of high school, I spent in, uh, in Europe and in a very international environment, having grown up as someone who was, you know, half Libyan and half American and very much half, half. So not, you know, I never under, understood how I could define myself as an Arab American, because for me, that meant more like my Arab identity in the United States. So my identity was very much bifurcated. Um, my mother, you know, American living in, in California, well, we lived in Egypt and then her family in Minnesota. My father, very Libyan and his family living in Egypt um, because they left Libya in 1969. So I had this like two very different sides of, of my life. And I wanted to put that to use in my, my academic uh, life at, once I got to Brown. So studying international relations and Middle East studies and really understanding the context of the world that I grew up in. And then um, thinking what I wanted to do in my professional career. Did I want to go work at the State Department? Did I want to go work at an investment bank, which seemed to be at the time what so many people were doing? And I, you know, I think in, in life, you know, certain things happen by chance and by luck. I was put in touch by a, a friend of mine from Brown, her, her mother, with a, a project that was happening in Egypt, in Siwa, on the border of Libya, um, and at a time when I'd never been to Libya. Um, and it was an art project by the Kabakov, so, you know, Russian-Ukrainian artists who had fled, uh, you know, former Soviet Union, found their way to America, then were doing a project in Egypt on the border of Libya, and the whole thing, you know, sounds very... Um, romantic and cliche in a way, but it's where I saw the power of art to change communities and to change lives. And then from there, I really believed in what contemporary art can do and what culture can do for societies and, you know, made this life for myself um, in a very, let's say, non-traditional way. You know, I don't have like one role or one life, but like you said, you know, helped start our Dubai, um, now working, you know, very deeply in what the, the kind of immense changes that are happening in Saudi Arabia and really believe in the power of art and culture to, to change society for the better. That's great. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd like to, um, continue. I, I was very, um, surprised to find out that we actually, we overlapped for quite a while at SOAS University of um, London and um, where you did your PhD jointly with uh, a very dear colleague, Professor Charles Tripp. Um, so we didn't know each other at the time, but I know uh, that you worked with Charles. And um, so could you tell us about that project? How did it come about and what were your main findings? What were you actually researching for your PhD? So it came about, um, so as uh, Catherine mentioned in her in very kind introduction was, I'm very involved with the Tate. And uh, Sheena Wagstaff um, at the time, who was the chief curator there, and then uh, just recently has left the Met, 
um, wonderful figure in my life. And Sheena and Venetia Porter, who is Charles's wonderful wife and the just also has left her position a long time at the British Museum as the keeper of Islamic art there, uh, kind of ganged up at, on me because um, I told them how much I enjoyed teaching and how much I enjoyed. Um, so I have done you know a variety of guest lectures and and uh, appearances like this and at Art Dubai, many art fairs. And I just said how much I enjoy teaching. So, well, you need to go get your PhD. And I said, oh my God, go back to school. I'm like, really? Um, and uh, Venetia said, you have to go talk to my husband. So, you know, I, I go and, and, and meet with Charles. And, and of course he gives me this extremely rigorous interview. And I said, I don't know if I'm ready for this, but um, you know, the, the journey began there by Sheena and Venetia saying, you know, this is your path. And very much, you know, when people ask, you know, what is my specialty? What do I do? I am not an art historian. Um, and, you know, I am somebody who's deeply interested in politics and deeply interested in the way in which we connect contemporary art and politics and the way in which culture and cultural diplomacy and soft power, you know, pay, play into that. So Charles and I, um, you know, it, it took me a, a couple of years. I actually should take a look back at my emails and see how long to submit my final proposal, which was only two pages, but for some reason, you know, I wasn't emotionally ready for it. Um, and then uh, began that journey. And I have to say, as much as my, you know, PhD was very much on the subject of, you know, cultural diplomacy and soft power in Saudi Arabia, which is a very relevant notion now, it's actually completely obsolete because it was all pre- pre-Vision 2030, pre-Ministry of Culture, pre-everything. So the, the findings, you know, were about, you know, the kind of the power of a group of um, elite patrons, you know, who really poured their heart and souls into um, culture in the country. Um, but it's actually completely irrelevant now, so... You're taking... Yeah, I guess, uh, Catherine, maybe, uh, I mean, I assume we'll follow up on those changes uh, later on. It will be interesting to find out. So what has actually changed since then? But over to you, Catherine. Yeah, but that ties into my next question. Mm -hmm. actually, because when I was doing my homework about your your past, I came across an article that was uh, focused on you in The Economist. And I think it was published in 2010? 2010, I think, yeah. 2010. So that's still about 13 years ago. And <laughs> I wrote down one of the, the, a quote that you had in that, that piece, which I found really fascinating. You said, um, the name of the article uh, was called, is called The Trojan Horse, Women's Role in the Middle East Art Market. And you noted, and this is a quote, arts have given women in the Middle East a freedom, a freedom of expression. Being in the arts allows you to tackle all sorts of social issues and political issues cushioned in an area that's considered non-threatening. Non so 13 mm -hmm. years on, I thought maybe you could talk about some of the changes and um, some of the developments and the evolutions since you um, were quoted in that article in the arts world and some of the challenges as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that that article actually was a really important, um, really important turning point for me, but also for, I think a lot of people, there were several other um, women quoted in there and the lady who wrote it is actually since a, a very dear friend. Um, and I found out we did then did a podcast um, in, I remember in New York and I had almost completely lost my voice, which happens to me often. And it was the most listened to podcast for The Economist for that entire month. And it was that people were so hungry for that information. And, you know, I started in the art world. So kind of going back to the previous question, but tying into this at a time when there was not one other international female Arab, except for one other person who worked at an auction house, who actually is now since um, the CEO of the Visual Arts Commission in Saudi Arabia, Dina, and she was focusing on contemporary art in general, not even on the Middle East. And I, you know, was really young and could travel the world with, you know, no, no problems and all the time. And people were really excited about what was happening in Abu Dhabi. They, when my first year on the job, they announced Saudi at Island, um, which is now, you know, where the Louvre Abu Dhabi and they're building the Guggenheim and other amazing projects and our Dubai then started the second year. So it was at this moment where all of these things were happening and then the economist article comes along. So that's about my fourth year or fifth year of working in the art world. And 
it was all women, you know, and it was true that people really didn't pay attention. And for example, what was happening in Saudi is that you had incredible artists. And, you know, as Chris Durkan, I remember coming to the very first edition of Edge of Arabia and then the Saudi Art Council show, he said, what Saudi has is they have artists. And people didn't realize, you know, or they didn't pay attention. And artists have the power to explain things and show things to the world that perhaps governments don't necessarily understand. Some governments understand better than others. Um, and it was this Trojan horse, just like the article said, women in these positions of great power translating identity. And actually that was the beginning of my PhD was really talking about national identity in terms of art and culture. It's then shifted to being more about cultural diplomacy, but really translating national identity in terms of how you see yourself in, in, in visual culture um, was the premise. And uh, Maisel Kasumi actually has a really great quote in a more recent article about why women are in these positions. And that it's considered, art is considered a, a kind of soft, uh, a soft profession, something that doesn't really matter, you know, not like finance or, you know, every, you know, parent, you see the stereotypes of like, they want their kid to be a lawyer or a doctor, right? Not an artist, not a, a curator. What is that? Um, so art had this opening for women and oftentimes women from more privileged backgrounds. So I will, you know, kind of, I, I do concede that notion that it sometimes is considered a, a kind of more privileged, um, position. Um, but with something with great power, but power that isn't able to be translated. So even, you know, when you see the fights that happen in the UK now over, you know, the budgets and the, you know, for the, the art fund and, and uh, the arts council, every dollar, you know, every pound that goes back into the economy from culture, it's, it's Im almost impossible to be measured. I mean, Nick, Sir Nicholas Sirota tries very hard. You know, every year they come up with these amazing studies and they try to prove, you know, for every pound given to a museum, six to eight pounds goes back into the economy. But it's still very hard for people to understand just how that works. Yeah. Maybe yeah, that was... was... Oh, go ahead, Nadia. Yeah, yeah I was wondering whether... Uh, I mean, I think it would be great for our audience to maybe see some images, if you have some images of art that uh, and, and talk us through some of this. Yes. So, I mean, I think we have, um, I think Emily is, is here with us and we have, um, I think, so two parts of the slides. We have um, the first part I've kind of tried to, well, of course, want to represent um, all the GCC countries as the, per the title. And then um, the second half will focus more on the artists that I work directly with in Saudi Arabia. So I think that's towards the end of our, our conversation. So, you know, we can just, I mean, I think in general, just to talk about, you know, female artists in the Middle East. And there's a great quote. I'm going to, if you just excuse me, I'm going to use this paper um, from a show that Massimiliano Gioni um, curated about art in the Arab world. And Emily, you can just actually kind of click through and we can just show everyone. Sophia Maria, for example, who's from Qatar, but lives um, uh, also in the United States. Um, Hala Khalifa from Bahrain. Um, but Massimiliano Gioni, who was also a curator of the Venice Biennale um, two editions ago, he said, it is one of the many stereotypes this, this exhibition tries to question. A certain Western view assumes that women in Arab countries are oppressed and left out of any cultural debate. We found instead that women artists were doing great works. We didn't set out to show more of them or to use women and their work as some kind of example. It simply turned out that many of the works we found to be compelling were being made by women. And I think, you know, that that's <laughs> such an important thing to say. It's not that you're being forced to, uh, to acknowledge, um, you know, women with a certain quota. But in fact, for example, Farah al Qasmi is somebody who I think is absolutely incredible and fantastic from a traditional uh family in the UAE and shows her her living rooms her family living rooms her grandfather's um majlis in many of her works and kind of traditional family homes in the UAE in her work and you know her gallerist is Sunny Raybar from the third line so an, another kind of incredible um Iranian Emirati a female and had this solo presentation in Art Basel, uh, in Basel, and, you know, kind of a really premier, premier 
setting and showing in the art world. Um, and it was like a sold out booth and, you know, featured in the New York times and an incredible thing to see. So, you know, I think that it is important to acknowledge that women in the Middle East have for a long time had these positions of power. Munir al Qadiri, like another one who also, you know, kind of has worked across, um, across, uh, you, you know, sectors and many major shows in, uh, of course, in, in the Middle East and featured in the Sharjah Biennale, but also um, internationally. Um, I believe, I might get this wrong, but I believe the first time I met her was at Delfina Foundation in London. And I think that it's also important to acknowledge that there are these networks of, uh, of support. So, you know, as Catherine said, you know, what is it to be a cultural strategist? I mean, so much of the work, of course, um, I do is, you know, professionally and I'm, you know, paid for, but then so much of the work I do and that I believe really strongly and that does tie into my professional life is about supporting these networks like Delfina Foundation, even uh, Art Dubai, which is a commercial art fair, but for me was such an important platform for artists uh, from the region. Uh, Tate, the Middle East Committee, British Museum, their, um, uh, the Middle East acquisitions um, there also. And it's about making sure that artists from the region are acknowledged in these international and governmental institutions. Um, you know, the, the MoMA has done an incredible job in New York, uh, really also because Glenn Lowry, the director, was somebody who came to the first Art Dubai and came many times, came to Saudi Arabia for the first Edge of Arabia and really understood, you know, what artists were doing uh, in the region. Yeah, and Glenn, I think he traveled a lot throughout the Middle East and he speaks yes. a little bit of Persian as well. Yes. And I think his, um, so his, if I'm not mistaken, his either undergraduate or PhD was on the subject of um, uh, Orientalist art, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah. Fascinating. Great. Right. Uh, did you want to say something about Radhika? So, Radhika Kimchi, so for example, this work was, um, well, this artist was featured in the Oman Pavilion in Venice. And so this idea of also having um, artists from the international art world acknowledged and exposed in uh, these really important international settings, I always have found to be really important. And I think the fact that you now see more Arab countries, I mean, the UAE was really a, a front runner on this and having secured a permanent uh, pavilion at the Venice Biennale uh, was a really important moment. You now have Oman showing last year, Saudi Arabia showing, um, and you know, being in the context of this very important gathering of the international art world. So, um, you know, I think Radhika, you know, is an example of that. Mm -hmm. So maybe I continue with uh, another question, if that is okay. Yes, great. Yeah. So, um, Alia, you mentioned that you're very much interested in politics and you also mentioned soft soft power and cultural diplomacy but when i'm thinking about the countries that you're interested in i mean politics with a bigger p also plays a role right so i'm yeah. thinking of course sanctions um you know the question in how far uh geopolitical factors such as sanctions on iran or political tensions amongst neighboring countries such as the UAE with Oman, Iran and Qatar, as well as, of course, the war in, in Syria, how all this might impact on arts production and the market in the region. I mean, so the problem, I mean, the fundamental, my fundamental problem with the growth and I think lack of growth in what we see in terms of the Middle East um, in general, so I'm not just talking about the Arab world, but Middle East market as the way in which it's defined by the auction houses, for example, um, is that there is a, it's it's not a robust market. You don't have a huge desire to buy or sell, you know, major artworks like you see in China. You know, you don't. There are there there's just a general lack of collectors, and it's an unfortunate thing. Um, you, of course, you have some and you have people who do, you know, help hold this up. So that is to me the kind of fundamental problem of 
what you see in terms of growth. I hope that we see more and more. And every year you do see more. And of course, it's more than it was 15 years ago when I started. Um, and then in terms of the political aspect, how that functions is that it really, I mean, the UAE has been such a kind of amazing home to many artists um, who have come from Iran, who have come from Lebanon. Um, and you see, um, for example, you know, Hassam, um, Rahmanian and Rockney and Ramin Harizadeh, this kind of wonderful trio collective, but also operating as artists on their own. I mean, they, they're they Iranian, but living many, many years in Dubai. Um, and in many ways, like taken as, as locals and, you know, loved and, and beloved as, you know, these Dubai and Emirati figures, but are of course Iranian. And you see this in many Lebanese artists, um, you know, Walid Rad having gone to New York and of course somebody so identified as Lebanese, but his home is New York. Um, and I think, you know, geopolitics as I mean, the first, my first moment in the art world was with artists who had fled, you know, Russia, Ukraine and uh, living in New York. So I think you definitely see that. Oh. Next shift froze. Hope that uh, to come back. Alia, can you hear us? Hmm. Oh, you froze for a moment, but now you're back. Oh, no, and I'm saying, sorry, apologies. Um, I was saying that, you know, artists who have fled their countries, I think it particularly has impacted the UAE. And I think in a really interesting way, because you have seen this hub of artists who have gone there from as I said, from Iran, from Lebanon. Um, and then funnily, in, funnily enough, in terms of Saudi, most of the artists who live and work there really are, you know, Saudi born and have now returned um, and always returned, you know, after university abroad or after studies abroad or work abroad and are living and working there and actually really excited about the changes they see in the last three to five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a quick follow up question before I hand it over to Catherine. So uh, um, I've been watching Dubai Bling and I see <laughs> and I see there's uh, lots of wealth and lots of conspicuous consumption and fashion. So how do you explain this lack of interest in collecting art? Or you said, you know, there are very few people. The market is very sort of precarious how do you explain that because there seems to be great interest in displaying wealth in other ways yeah. jewelry and fashion uh why not art so through so one of my professional hats is working with art basel and it is such a particular thing to how do you describe how do you create a collector how do you make a collector how do you make a discerning collector and it is something that people still do not quite understand how to do, except for perhaps, you know, for example, right now I'm in Mexico City and you have the example that there was this one great collector who was very public about his collection, Eugenio Lopez, who um, is the family that uh, started Humex, which is Hugo Mexico. So kind of a major industrial uh, company, of course, great wealth, very philanthropic. And Eugenio happens to have really great taste. He bought early Jeff Koons. He bought, you know, early artists of all sorts of genres and decided he wanted to publicly display his collection. And of course there were other collectors and I'm going to get, I'm sure, really uh, criticized by anyone who <laughs> is very Mexican and knows others. But for the international art world, Eugenio was really the first example of a great Mexican collector. And it allowed a generation of people behind him to then think, oh, collecting art is sexy and cool. And actually it helps you make money because he collected Jeff Koons very early on. And now his Jeff Koons is worth, you know, 25 X of, you know, what he bought it for. And people then realized that there was interest and it also was a display of who your, your culture was, you know, Frida Kahlo, you know, Mexican icon. People want her work. George O'Keefe, American icon. Alice Walton wanted to buy that and own that for an American museum. So for some reason, it hasn't quite gotten there in uh, 
in the UAE yet, and even in Saudi also, there's not yet this robust art market. The artists are mostly collected by a small handful of collectors and uh, and, and government now with after the kind of recent initiatives. But I think that people need to see an example and need to understand that it's worth something intangible and tangible. Okay. Yeah. Catherine? Yeah. I think the question of class comes up again um, mm -hmm. in that discussion. Um, and also, I was really fascinated by what you said about Dubai and how Dubai is such a hub and such a crossroads mm -hmm. for, for people who are displaced and who are working in the arts. I think that's really important. And that sort of leads on to my next question. Um, so we have artists and curators and cultural strategists like yourself who have been playing a vital role in increasing the visibility of marginalized voices in the arts. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how artists and people who are working around artists like yourself are dealing with um, censorship from the top down. And I think this is particularly interesting at a time when um, the arts have become such an important platform for democratic forms of expression. Mm -hmm. So I think what also is fascinating to me about um, the Arab world and about what I've seen, particularly in the UAE and Saudi, where they're, let's say, the two more close countries where I've worked, um, and then seeing China. So one of my dearest friends is a major museum director there, and having gone to China and seeing you know, the way in which you can't even use your phone um, in, the, in a normal way that you are used to is that it's just so different. In the Middle East, censorship, it's this like kind of unspoken, hidden, hidden way of being. And frankly, you don't experience it or feel it. I have never, and I have done many shows and worked in many forums in, across you know, the Arab world and never experienced it directly. But artists are very aware. And somebody like Manal Doyan, she talks about it often. And we talked about it for my PhD. Um, and in her, her current work, I mean, she's going to be showing at the Guggenheim in, in New York and the Rotunda in May. Um, but Manal, and she's going to be showing a work about film censorship in the non-Arab world, in the rest of the world, you know. And Manal always said, you know, she knew just how far she could go. She always knew with her work what she was talking about, you know, in the kind of previous, the old Saudi Arabia, as they say, um, women being... Uh, made to ask for permission to leave the country, women being made to, you know, ask permission for all, any kind of government documents from their, uh, you know, their guardian. Um, and she did works that were explicitly about that, but couched in terms that were acceptable to the authorities and acceptable to, you know, there was no Ministry of Culture anyway, but acceptable to whoever would be looking at her work. And I believe that artists like Manal um, and others of her, of her uh, generation are the reason we see the kind of immense and amazing changes in Saudi now, because they took those conversations to the limit of what they knew would be acceptable for that moment with no, there was no actual uh, uh, legislation, but they knew what they could say and how far they could say it. So I actually think that Censorship is not, it's not really an obvious, it's, it's not obvious in the Arab world, or at least in anything I've ever worked with and the artists I've worked with. I think I'm going to push you a bit on that point, Alia, if, if I may, because I guess given the kinds of work that I've done, you know, with maybe, yeah, I mean, feminist activists and writers, and I, I, I understand that they are more explicitly pushing the boundaries, but also, of course, journalists, um, you know, who very much experience censorship. And I, I take your point that, you know, there is this, you know, walking this fine line, you know, pushing th things a little bit, but not too much. But by doing that, you know, creating a bit of space. But when is that being complicit? You know, I think that's a sort of fine line. And I'm thinking here, you know, yeah. yeah. You know, I'm thinking here specifically, of course, um, although not exclusively, but, you know, when you think about Saudi Arabia, you know, we know that, uh, you know, women have gained a number of important rights over the last years. Of course, you know, the most, uh, you know, everyone is speaking about the 
the right to drive, um, but also, you know, removal of travel restrictions for women over 21, um, granting women more control over civil status issues. Mm -hmm. But we also know that there are several women's rights activists and many political dissidents who are imprisoned. I mean, I know a few women uh, activists who are actually colleagues. So how can we actually talk about women and gender in Saudi Arabia without falling into the trap of either on the one side reifying orientalist and simplistic stereotypes about women's oppressions, but at the same time also avoid romanticizing and romanticizing what's going on and ignoring persistent structural inequalities and, frankly, human rights abuses? I mean, I think it's it's obviously it's a a persistent question um, yeah. and thing that I'm asked all the time um, in terms of my role. But I have to say, what I also find really deeply disturbing is that people don't want to see any of the positive that happens, right? And I've had those conversations, and of course, not with you know someone who understands the nuanced visions like you you do. But so many people really don't want to see any of the positive. And in some ways, I think that that allows the the kind of persistence on the other side because there's never an ability to have just a normal conversation about it. And I think, I mean, I work in the visual arts world, right? And I think that it's very different than um, writing. And because for some reason, the visual arts were never seen as important in, in, you know, in the context of, I don't know, even Saudi or in uh, the UAE or many countries the visual arts were never kind of considered in a way the same as poetry um, or, uh, or, you know, in, in any kind of writing. And I think that's perhaps, I mean, as kind of discussed with Charles when I was doing my PhD, why I was focusing on the visual arts rather than that, because the Quran, of course, was of such importance. Um, and so the written word was of such importance, um, the spoken word. Um, so for me, what I try to do and hopefully have been achieving is thinking of all of the positives that come and perhaps just giving time to a moment. And I think, you know, you've seen people, uh, you know, being exonerated in jails in America, you know, in, in these kind of incredible moments of like the justice project and, and hoping that wrongs will be righted. Um, and in terms of the artists that I've worked with, it's only ever been really this idea of progression. So I don't know how it works in different contexts or different cultural sectors, but the positivity is overwhelming. I mean, just absolutely overwhelming. Like you feel it in every conversation, in every normal conversation, not even like, you know, intellectual conversations. So, I mean, I also work, for example, I was shocked in Art Basel two years ago, there was a massive protest in the streets and we had to shut the, the, uh, the public transportation. And I had no idea what it was for. And it was for their Women's Day because Switzerland was the last country in the Western world to give women the right to vote in something like 1969 or something. I mean, crazy. So I think thinking of things in terms of timing and history, I found that completely shocking. Um, and I think what I try to do is hope that this rapid change means rapid change and positivity in all ways. Yeah, I mean, this is a big conversation, but I don't want to monopolize it. Yeah. Catherine, yeah. you want to continue? I'm thinking about Iran a lot during this conversation with the artists who were, um, I mean, it depends on the particular moment in time, but in some you know, some force in time had enough space to do incredible work, even though they're living in an authoritarian country, but there's just enough space to create an amazing art that was really self-expressive and, and quite critical uh, as well. Um, but then there was always that point of uncertainty as to when there could be a backlash against them and their art, and that's really what we're seeing right now. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, um, it's really difficult to navigate. And like you said, it's very context specific mm -hmm. and every location has their own particular histories at the same time connected to 
global solidarity groups and what Nadia was talking about before. So it's it's really a lot to navigate for artists. Mm -hmm. um, which leads on to my, my next question. Um, we talked about artists in a sense, you were saying that artists themselves sort of know how to navigate in Saudi, what, what they're producing. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm also thinking about artists that come from outside who are not from Saudi, because now that it's mm -hmm. opening up to the, to the world, um, how do, are you one of the advisors and trying to navigate how artists from the outside can be within the context of Saudi and how does that work? And I'm thinking about, and you're in visual arts, of course, but I'm thinking about Beyonce and oh. why and that situation, which maybe I thought you could talk about. I mean, I think that, um, you know, art. So, for example, you have the Warhol, the Andy Warhol show opening in um, Al Ula next week or in a few days. Um, and the uh, director, you know, kind of just to kind of head on to your question, even though it wasn't explicitly about LGBTQ issues was, you know, he was asked, oh, my God, you know, how are you working in Saudi? And, you know, uh, you know, how is that possible? He said, I'm an openly gay man uh, as the director of the Warhol Foundation, which, you know, Andy Warhol was, of course, a extremely progressive uh, LGBTQ um, uh, figure and activist. Um, and he said, I think that it's important to show his work in that context. The work is about fame. So the show is titled Fame. And people are like, why aren't you showing the famous, you know, transvestite uh, portrait of um, one of Andy Warhol, like one of the main characters in Andy Warhol's um, uh, world? And he's like, because that's not what the show is about. But anyone who Googles Andy Warhol can see what he's about. And Google is open in Saudi. And I think... The same like Beyonce, I mean, she is, of course, this incredible figure. And I wish I had been at the concert. <laughs> I think she's just amazing. And I don't think, I think- uh, Sorry, she, Alia, can you tell, maybe the audience doesn't know what happened. Can you quickly- oh, yeah. Well, actually, Catherine was the one who yeah, told Catherine, me- Catherine, maybe you- Yeah, well, there's, there's some press about Beyonce going to put on a concert and getting paid a, a large sum of money and not- um, I don't know if she selected certain tracks off her of Renaissance or did not do Renaissance album in its entirety, which is dedicated to Black queer uh, culture. And mm -hmm. so it, I think that she's been criticized for self-censoring in the context of the- well, I, think that it, I think that for me, what I've noticed more and more, um, and you know, perhaps as I, I'm- more aware or more comfortable in my own self in that aspect is that there is a subtlety to sexuality in the Middle East. And I'm sure many people in this audience and Nadia, actually, you will be able to speak to this much more. Um, you know, you don't have heterosexual couples who kiss or show public displays of affection in the way that you do in other cultures. And it's just different. And it's not, and I've never seen it in a way that's different than that. So I think that's a, its own separate subject, which I can't talk about or talk to because I don't, you know, kind of break that down. Um, I'm sure there are many studies about that. But I think that in terms of artists from the West coming into Saudi, I've worked with um, several great land artists. So Michael Heiser um, uh, coming to Saudi Arabia. And there was never, of course, a problem because he's a land artist. There's not, there's no app figuration there's no anything um and i think it's more about thinking what works in what context you have Noor riyadh the light festival and i think it's about exposing people to art and a culture art and culture in a way that makes them want to understand more and i think that's what any great exhibition does you know you had at the tate uh, soul of a nation um that was programmed as kind of a non-blockbuster but great curatorial uh, show about um, you know black art in the United States during the civil rights period, um, which we're actually probably still living, I, I would assume. Um, and that show was a blockbuster hit and people learned so much. And then that show traveled to four different venues around the United States, teaching people something in a very different way than was originally intended. So I think, um, you have that ability in a country like Saudi and a country like in, in places like the UAE. I mean, the new uh, Sharjah Biennale has just opened what two days ago. Um, and people are already kind of talking about what they're seeing there in that context. 
So I think artists have an ability to translate something at the Doris Salcedo, sorry, not to be super long on this, but one of the most incredible works about, let's say, protest or about uh, humanity is Doris Salcedo's Palimpsest, which I just saw at the Byler Foundation. And it is names in water that kind of rises and ebbs and flows up and down on these concrete slabs of names of uh, migrants and refugees that have been killed um, and drowned in the Mediterranean. And there is no dead body to see. There is no, you know, horror that you're like inflicted upon seeing in a, in a kind of an image, but you are so moved and it is horror and it is absolute tragedy what you're witnessing, but it's just names and it's just water and it's absolutely incredible. Sounds incredible. Yeah, so I'm conscious of time and we have some questions and comments, but I was hoping to ask one more question that would also maybe allow you to show some more images uh, specifically um, of Saudi female artists, because I know you've been focusing on Saudi Arabia. So I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit um, about Saudi female artists and the question how gender impacts both the production and the reception of art. So I think if Emily, if we can start showing, I think I would start with Manal Doyan, who I mentioned already. Um, you know, so you have this kind of now really a shift from this work, for example, by Manal. Um, and Manal, who has lived through many stages of, of uh, being a Saudi female artist. Um, and really now a global artist, of course, she's gonna be showing at the Guggenheim in, in uh, May. Um, this work specifically is about, uh, you can see it's the shape of a dove and the writing on it um, is uh, documents of the signatures required, the documents required for females to travel or you know, kind of any governmental um, kind of, uh, from their guardians to get anything done or move or, or um, be. And she showed this prominently in Venice um, at the during the Bien uh, kind of uh, satellite show the Biennale. She showed this um, many times in Saudi, uh, and I think really important because now that's obviously no longer required. You know, these papers no longer are needed or exist. And if we go to the next slide, um, you have an artist like Maha Malouh, who um, was the first Saudi artist to be. Um, and as not even as a female first Saudi artist in general to enter the collection of the Tate and also uh, many other institutions are, uh, in, in the Western world and uh, was the first Saudi artist to be shown in the main show of the Venice Biennale. Um, and I believe it was Massimiliano Joni's show and was in the main Arsenale section and a similar work to this. Um, and this work is about traditional uh, uh, kind of cooking. They're huge, enormous cooking pots. Um, you can't tell the scale from this picture, but when you see them, I mean, almost the size of, you know, a, a child. And her other work that was prominently displayed at the original, uh, the inaugural, excuse me, at Diria Biennale in December of last year, the very first work you see alongside Richard Long um, was Mahamalur cassette tapes. And I encourage anyone uh, watching, please Google that and Google this work because that talks so much about you know, what Meha says about the kind of the old Saudi Arabia, and actually says not the old Saudi Arabia, because Saudi Arabia wasn't that way before. It only became that way after 1979. Um, these cassette tapes of, uh, of of sermons that were, you know, she says crazy speak. They they had nothing to do with Islam. They had nothing to do with uh, beliefs or, or reality. Um, and they were all candy colored and like green and pink and really, you know, fun for people to buy in the markets. And that's what people would listen to. Um, and now, of course, they're they're outlawed and banned. And Maha, you know, I'm going to say it here, and I, I know that she would be okay with that. She, you know, every time I bring a visitor to her, she's this, you know, of course, incredible artist and has this amazing studio in Riyadh. Uh, and it's always you know, Hans Ulrich Oberist, Maya Hoffman, all these kind of incredible people from the international art world coming to visit her. She says to them, she says, MBS has done more for women's rights than any person in the history of humanity in a quick and short period of time. And she believes that because she talks about 
when she was a young mother, she wasn't able to take her daughter who had broken her arm to the hospital. She wasn't able to do things that, you know, for the benefit of her daughters and her family because of, of the rules at that time. So Matt is somebody who's very interesting because she does talk about the problems and she talked about them pre vision 2030 and pre this moment. Um, and so the next slide, I think we'll see Sara Abu Abdullah, also, you know, an artist who has been kind of embraced in a Western context, working very much in conceptual um, in conceptual art. And somebody also works partially in the, the Ministry of Culture at a time when she wasn't able to kind of fully have her, her artistic practice in her studio. And you'll see that actually Manal Doyan started off as an engineer in Aramco, um, you know, before she was able to fully commit herself to her artwork. And Sara had a show in Germany, also curated by Hans Ulrich. Um, and then the next slide. And then actually funny enough, um, with Marwa and Sara were both featured artists in the Biennale also like Maha. And this is the work that was shown live. Look at like women with their hair out and, you know, not wearing what you would think of like traditional black abayas, which actually no longer almost exist. Um, this was a performance in Riyadh, in the Duria Biennale. And you saw girls around me in tears watching this, never imagining that this was the Saudi that they would live in. Um, and it was incredible. It was about these very visceral uh, dance movements, um, women who were from Riyadh, um, some you know, who were originally Saudi, others not, and really just expressing themselves. And Sarah Abu Abdullah, the previous slide, um, one of the main works she had in the Biennale was, uh, was a painting uh, a collaboration she did with her mother um, and it was very special to see that interaction because her mother also didn't think that she would ever have had that moment as an artist. And so I think after Marwa, if we go next two slides, you have Sarah Brahim. This was the kind of finale work um, at the Biennale, a video uh, piece of, um, of a dance work. And Sarah uh, is half Saudi, half American, grew up uh, kind of between those worlds and studied as a professional dancer, um, a very rigorous uh, ballet training than uh, contemporary dance and reinterpreted her dance um, as a Saudi artist and, and as an international artist and doing a show about the body. And like you can see, there's touch, but no touch. Um, and also something you never would have imagined seeing in Saudi five years ago um, and really moved many, many people. Um, and Sara, of course, to great critical acclaim. So uh, kind of huge standout and, and somebody who's become very dear to me and I think an incredible uh, young female Saudi artist, but doing so much in the world of performance art in general in the world. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alia. Um, we ha just have a few minutes. We have a number of questions and comments. Um, should I start or do you want to start reading uh, some, uh, Catherine? Go ahead. Okay, so the first one um, is um, by Anmar Ayoub, uh, who says, it's my first webinar at Brown um, after I applied to be a first year at your amazing university. I'm a Middle Easterner from Iraq and the country went through a civil war. But after the war, I saw that culture, including food, dance, clothes and art is uniting different people instead of separating. I want to ask you, Alia, if there is a similar experience of uniting people by art in Egypt or Libya. Well, in Egypt, actually what's happening now is quite interesting in the sense that you have this kind of major government museum opening, the Grand Egyptian Museum and GEM, uh, GEM. And it's been extremely delayed, decades practically, um, but inshallah, inshallah opening uh, this year. And I've been working on bringing contemporary art um, into that project. And if anyone remembers during COVID when we were all watching lots of videos, there was this amazing procession that they did of the mummies coming from the National Museum in Tahrir Square out to Gem. And I think that will be a real game changer. And I'm really very excited and very proud um, to just be a small part of that project uh, because you'll see contemporary art in the context of ancient art and culture. And for me, I think what's a little bit of a problem of what you see in Egypt is that it's just this obsession with ancient heritage and not really looking at what incredible artists are doing in the here and now. And you have 
Egyptian modernists. Um, you know, so there was this uh, kind of incredible show that Tate Liverpool traveled. Um, it was also uh, partly at or Dubai, if I'm not mistaken, um, about and at the Pompidou about Egyptian modern uh, painting. And you know, and I remember, of course, um, a cinema project that happened at the ICA in uh, in London about Egyptian cinema. And you see these like incredibly sexy, fabulous movies and posters. I mean, women totally revealed at a time in the United States when Lucy and Ricky couldn't be in share a marital bed together, you know? And so there's this kind of shift in what we think about Egypt. And I think hopefully we'll, we're seeing that reclaimed. Libya, unfortunately, is a much more complicated story. Um, uh, there are several um, artists and initiatives that are happening, but of course, in a very limited way. I mean, just the kind of ability to travel is so difficult there. Um, the ability for artists to, to kind of function and work. Um, you have an amazing poet and, uh, and and you have an amazing writer like Hisham Matar and his wife, Diana, who are showing a vitrine at the British Museum right now about their travels and trips to Libya. Um, but Libya, unfortunately, is a more complicated story mm -hmm. and a sad story. Great, thank you for that, Elia. Should I read a few more this, comments um, and a couple of questions? Yeah, I just have a few minutes, so maybe. Yeah, so maybe I just read one. Um, there is so much fascination about how does one work creatively in authoritarian regimes, or what I like to simply call kingdoms. That's the bigger picture. That the bigger picture is ignored, and that is what what inspires these artists to do the work that they're doing under what the West would most likely term as trying circumstances or a trying environment. Mm -hmm. How would you address that? I mean, I think the most, and thank you, Sabine, and thank you, um, Ahmed, for those, um, your questions. So Sabine, I would say, and you say before, you know, you uh, want to pursue art, but um, don't necessarily have the, the education in art. And I think that's the wonderful thing about contemporary art is that you can really educate yourself. And I think actually artists in these authoritarian regimes um, have done that. You know, there is still, which I find absolutely shocking, not a full functioning art school in the GCC. You know, you've seen this kind of amazing uh, movement in museums in Doha. And we, we've, you know, talked very little about uh, Qatar, but um, Doha and in the UAE, and there's still not a full functioning art school. Um, and artists have had to go abroad and then they come home. And I think those are the artists um, that understand most, how do you work in these circumstances, a trying circumstance or environment? Somebody like Manal, somebody like Maha, you know, Maha Maluh is, you know, a lady in her sixties and, you know, never went to a traditional art school, but is a celebrated artist in her society. And now in West, in the West and in Western museums and institutions. This is almost a question only they can answer, but artists are artists who feel the need to make art. And it's when you people say, oh, can you watch an exhibition online? You know, can you like travel through an exhibition online? Uh -huh. And there's no power like seeing a work of art in person. And I think that an artist who feels that they want to be an artist, they just make and they do. And the idea of censorship, as I said, is also very complicated in the Middle East because you don't see it so um, explicitly. So you have to kind of be somebody from a place and be understanding the nuances of that that society. Well, unfortunately, we have to stop. Uh, we have some more questions and comments, so uh, apologies uh, that we can't address all of them. Many, many thanks, Alia. This is a fascinating conversation. I'm sure we could have gone on for much longer. Um, so I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank the audience. And as always, also, of course, Catherine and um, a team here at Brown, Alexander yeah. Laferriere, Barbara Oberkörter, and Emily Rubelmann. Uh, Catherine, you would like to just... Uh, uh, thank you, Nadia. Um, and thank Thanks to the Brown team. And thank you, Alia. That thank was you. I was wonderful. And I can't wait to be back in person with you. I miss you. <laughs> yes, hopefully no, so. Exactly. No, for sure. And, <laughs> and, and in, in Colombia and Catherine with you. Yeah, absolutely.